basically that's perfect lead in this is burn the ship and burn have you ever heard the the term the phrase burn the ship before uh yeah i think so so I, it goes me, can back. i tell you what i think it means yeah yeah hit me with it all right so i'm pretty sure what it means is uh i think it dates back to like a uh, a war story where a general had his army and they went to go fight the war and he burned the ship behind him and mm -hmm. then there was nowhere to turn back so yes. they had to either win or die yeah am i on the right path yeah it's hernan cortez he's pulling up like south america to the aztecs and he's telling people burn all the ships because we're not <laughs> going back either we figure it out here or we die and uh a lot i know we, we draw a lot of parallels to that to entrepreneurship you know you gotta that. you gotta take that bet on yourself you have to be all in um you have to be the captain and your first mate and all the people around you that make it happen. And that's really just what the podcast has been about is, you know, what do you do? What is that skill set? What is your business? But really, why do you do it? What kind of impact do you want to leave on the community? What kind of people are you interacting with? What kind of legacy are you leaving? Um, you know, and what drives you to be what you are in, in your business and with your podcast and with everything that you do. And um, I just thought it was really interesting. I watched some of your content. I kind of wondered upon you on LinkedIn and then I watched some of your content. I thought it was very interesting. The, um, mm -hmm. the weight loss challenge, some of the names um, there I recognized really, really quick. Um, so just kind of the, you know, the deliverance, the dedication that you had to, to your brand and this organization was really cool. You know, we aspire to have that level of consistency and that level of longevity. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about it a little bit. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us what you do. All right. Uh, well, my name's Sean Lowry. And yeah, entrepreneurship is my favorite thing in the world. It's like, you know, an athlete has their sport. And like, I love entrepreneurship because it's something that's always going on. It's a sport. Uh, my business is Lowry Brands. It's like an e-commerce brand, but our main brand right now, we're going to build on it in the future into different brands. But we found this niche of monogram clothing. United Monograms is our brand. So that's where we have like our, our big following on social media. And uh, we have like a, a e half a million on the email list. Uh, and we have 15, 16 employees. And it's e-commerce. We sell personalized clothing to girls. And we've built up all the logistics of ordering supplies and, and decorating them. And we have embroidery. We have printing. We have a shipping department. And we have like 15, 16 employees and we just moved. Uh, we're in the process right now of moving from our 3,500 square foot building that we've been renting into uh, just purchased a 22,000 square foot warehouse. So it's like a really fun point for the company right now because we're growing really fast. And uh, that's where I'm spending all my time on. And that's what we do. And we do it great. We have great customers. And then the podcast, I've been doing it for, I guess, like a year and a half, 90 weeks. And... Uh, it's almost close to two years, and uh, I just love conversations like this. I love talking about business, and I love connecting with people. I've had some really big names on my podcast, like uh, Patrick Bet David is somebody who I've been following for years, and then when I got to talk to him on the podcast, it was so cool. So I love talking about business, and I love helping people, and I love connecting with people, and I've just had this urge to kind of get out there, talk about my journey, talk to other entrepreneurs, and that's why I started the podcast. And I think in the in the future, it could be cool to kind of build up a content uh, style business. We use some of our same resources for the podcast to make marketing material. And I love the business model of being able to create a piece of content. And hypothetically, only one cost of goods sold and having it, you know, reach millions of people. And that's different than what we do with our clothing because one cost of goods sold is one product. And, you know, we kind of keep building that. But I'm trying to make the two things go together, but the podcast has been on the side and the business, United Monograms, Lowry Brands, uh, has been a huge success and we're growing fast. So that's kind of, that's my, that's about me. So what, <laughs> what is your background? Where were you before? How long, what is the, what is like the, the time frame here of, of Lowry Brands and United Monograms? What were you doing before that and how long has it taken to kind of get where you are? So when I graduated college, I was 22, I'm 31 now and I got a job for three months and I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and just quit that job. I walked out on a Monday morning and I basically started my mom's basement around 23. So it's been eight years since I started from scratch with nothing, my mom's basement. And I started with t-shirts and I don't know why. I was going to go to my old fraternity at my college and I, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had it like inside me. It was, I had read the book, Think and Grow Rich. I was listening <laughs> to these, reading these books and, and I knew that I wanted to start something. I didn't necessarily know what, 
So I started telling the t-shirts in my mom's basement. It was, uh, it didn't go great. And then I just stuck with it. And then it eventually evolved over years. Uh, my now wife got involved. She, we kind of found this monogram niche, kind of snowballed. We moved from Philadelphia to Charleston, South Carolina, where I live now. And, uh, so eight years has kind of been from, from the very beginning to this new warehouse. Uh, that's been the journey. Sure. And what did you, uh, what did you study in college? Where'd you go to school? Uh, I went to Westchester university. Cool. Uh, it is uh, the home of uh, Jill Biden, which is like kind of cool. Just like all right, someone in the White House went to my college, and and Asher Roth, but uh, it's uh, it's right Bam outside Margera. of uh, you, you know Asher Roth. I uh, know Bam Margera. Bam Margera. Oh, Bam Margera. Uh, yeah, yeah he's in um, Westchester. What was their first TV show they did? They were when they were breaking everything right after Jackass. Jackass. Viva uh, La Bam. Yeah, that was Viva La Bam. Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. He wasn't a Westchester University guy. He was a Westchester like the city, mm-hmm. which is the same city. So. Uh, yeah, I went to Westchester University, loved it there, right outside of Philadelphia, great school. And I, I learned nothing from college. I graduated with <laughs> a marketing degree. <laughs> I do marketing now, I guess, but nothing I learned from college has specifically helped me besides for maybe like time management or something like that. But I have a marketing degree and it's it's essentially worthless. <laughs> 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 that seems to be uh, the consensus, you know, people that um, in their marketing degree, I think it's really hard to get a job. We were, uh, Tristan and I, my producer, were just talking the other day about how graphic mm-hmm. design is one of the place where people are really struggling to find jobs now as well. And people are so talented, you know, there are people, are, yeah. you know, and, and well, they can, they can sell, they can sell NFTs now. If, if yeah, good. that's true. That's true. That's, <laughs> yeah, maybe you should hop on that train, but yeah, <laughs> I bet. but uh, it's very interesting to see that, you know, marketing is one of the most prominent degrees, especially I went to UGA. Um, it's okay. very prominent there as well. Their Terry college of business is probably 50% those marketing, um, honestly, Grady school, their journalism school ends up being a lot of those, uh, marketing majors as well. But, you know, it's just strange to me. I see a lot of those people that are working, um, different places, different jobs. A lot of those people turn into being salespeople. Um, yeah. Kennesaw university Absolutely. right near us has actually started a sales program in their colleges, training you to be a successful salesperson, um, uh, on the, you know, business development side, rather than spending all that time learning marketing and everything. So, you finished school. Uh, you had this this idea to be an entrepreneur. You're starting with t-shirts in your basement. And then what was the thing that helped you scale up? I know you said you got your, your wife involved. Where did you start getting business from? Was it still that fraternity, sorority, connections, things like that al- along the school grounds? Or did you start no, kind of growing it wasn't into that. other spaces? Um, it wasn't that. So that business was selling to teams and groups, right? And like a lot of people that start a t-shirt company, they're like, I'm going to sell to teams and groups. And I started doing that and I hated it because it was too small minded. It was too local. I want to do something bigger. So I, I, the, my first success was actually, I'm a fan of Notre Dame football. I didn't go there or anything, you know, but, uh, yeah. And, the, and you're, you're like the bulldog. So yeah, screw yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're better than you. This I'm year. a Rudy fan, you know? All right. Fair enough. Fan. Fair enough. Um, but I had a Twitter account. I grew it to like 60,000 followers. I tweeted, this is around 2012, 2013. Um, when they were in the undefeated, went to the national championship Mm -hmm. and, uh, I started selling shirts to a Shopify store on there and it was awesome because I built an audience first and I didn't necessarily know why I was doing that. I just was doing it for fun, I guess. And then I, when I found out I could like build up an audience and then sell a product that could like just a link. Like, you know, people click on it. They're at the store uh, through the through the audience on on Twitter. And I started to fall in love with this idea of like e-commerce sales. And it could, you know, I wake up in the morning and I check my Shopify app and I see the sales I had from overnight. And that was like a whole new feeling for me. It was way different than the business that I was doing before. And I really felt that, ooh, this is something that can scale and grow. And now that was copyright infringement. <laughs> like so i couldn't stick with that and then i started doing these like america themed t-shirts like fourth of july uh it was called united tees and it was going pretty well i was able to um you know rent out some office space make enough money to be doing this full time and my wife then girlfriend was a kindergarten teacher she started to get involved just because like that's all i was ever doing so she basically wanted to she wanted to spend time with me she had to come get involved so she started making some girls designs made a little etsy store people started asking her about monograms we didn't really know what they were because they're very southern. You're, are you still in Georgia? Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, mon- you probably see girls wearing monogrammed clothing. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a very southern thing. It's crazy on our on our Google Analytics. There's like a map of the country, and it mm-hmm. shows the orange dots where everyone's shopping. Yeah, I was at the and, beach uh, this weekend, and there's no there are equal amount of grains of sand on the beaches. There are monogram cups walking around. <laughs> that's, the, that's what the I beach. love to hear. I love yeah. to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Half um, of them bought them from you, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, at least some of at least some of them bought them from us. Absolutely, because yeah, our sales have been great. But uh, so. We, we found this niche of monograms and, and I, I liked it because I mean, it's funny that I'm selling girls clothing cause I'm not like a super girly. So I like it because I can kind of attack the market without any bias. I just base it upon like what's selling and we're learning our customers and I don't have to like have any of my own spin on it about what I like. And also anyone can t- sell t-shirts, right? Like for my American pride brand, I would have like George Washington drinking a beer on a tank top and, but anyone else can make a design and sell it on like Teespring uh, or like that's where like you just make the design and they sell the product. Um, so it's very easy to get lost in any everyone else selling T-shirts. But the thing about monograms is not anyone else can just start it up because of the level of uh, personalization. It's more effort to produce it. And one thing I noticed when we found this great niche was that, wow, I'm basically like building a factory now. And in this day where so many e-commerce people like to – kind of have this i'm at the beach i'm selling online i don't have to do anything mentality i mean i respect that i'm not like that i want to work every second of every day i want to uh i I just love work and i love building so someone out there has got to be building the factory and the production and i've been doing that and i think in the future one thing lowry brands can do is possibly be that company where uh you know have you heard of teespring i haven't have you it's basically it's like it's like Zazzle or Cafe Press. It's basically you have a design. You want to sell T-shirts. You can go to the site, list it, put your design on a T-shirt, and then someone can buy it. And then the company will print and ship the shirt to the customer. You get a little bit of money. They get most of the money. But like you just sold a shirt to someone. And so like the company that does that, I think is something that my company could do in the future. Um, and that's one of the advantages of like having the factory and controlling the production. Like, there's power in that, I think. So that's one of the things that I'm excited about, like building the factory for. Sure. Um, but yeah, I forgot what the question was. But uh, uh, me too. <laughs> what was what's next for for you guys? I mean, obviously you're kind of transitioning from that, um, you know, being that manufacturer and that sales funnel, obviously to kind of you know growing some more branches on the tree. So what does you know what are the next steps for you guys? Where are you looking to grow? I mean, that's one of them that I just mentioned. Right now, mm-hmm. we have so many open orders for United monograms and that we just want to get those out. And for years we've been limited. We've had to turn off Facebook ads. We've had to shut down uh, like sales that we could be getting because we just can't produce it all because we don't have enough space. So step one, and that's where we're at right now is getting everything set up at the new building, increasing our production time, maximizing uh, the brand. And then we'll have so much more space. And once that's all set up, that's when we can maybe go back to selling for United Tees or look into the business model that I was just discussing, maybe using some of the space to build up, uh, I don't know, maybe we're calling it like Lowry Media, like the production stuff, sure. uh, the, the content side of the business, the podcast. Uh, but it's all opening up with this new space. And um, I don't know exactly. The exact answer is we're going to continue to pound and maximize the United Monograms brand. Sure. Um, but, How replicable is the e-commerce skills that you have learned? You know, are you still are you still operating via Shopify and kind of their yep. engine? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And how- it's actually it's very replicable. Um, the thing that's not replicable is the market and the customers and and finding if if we want to produce items and ship them to customers and sell it, that's you can replicate in a second. But it's more than that. It's connecting with an audience, finding out what they want to buy, selling it to them. So like if we wanted to create another brand, we'd have to like reconnect with, uh, say I brought United, United Tees is still actually an active site. If I wanted to bring that back, I'd have to start posting again, tweeting again, get involved with the customers, see what everyone wants, like look at the designs. Basically, you have to be in touch with your customers and what they want. And you have to like think about it all the time and obsess over it and focus on what your customers want. So the actual production and stuff like that is replicable, but we need to build a capacity where we have the teams to like, manage these different markets and brands and have the pulse of them know what's going on so and then sell them products that they want sure 
Absolutely. So, and and it's more just identifying that niche. It seems that a lot of you know the business owners that we talk about, the execution and logistics is what stands in the way of their businesses. Obviously, most of you know the difficult part. It's strange to me just to put myself in that e-commerce mindset. You know, having to be kind of reverse engineering what is that that process is like. We know we can send it. We know we can sell it. What is the thing that's going to connect with those people, and how do we generate that audience? It's a strange science to me. You know, I mean. I come from the merchant services world, the business services world, B two B, door knocking, B2B. networking. Um, so it's just a different, you know. You have to definitely be in touch with with what you're saying, the message that you're communicating to people. But it's such in a different way. It's so case right. by case. You know, it's it's not volume based. It's not really, um, you know, I could do ten deals with higher margin and more volume and make more money yeah. than someone that's right beside me that does a hundred deals and is finding them in a different pond. You know, so it's, right. it's interesting to me to kind of look at it from that lens of reverse engineering. What is that niche? What is that next thing that we're going to attack yeah. and conquer? Yeah. And, and if I did 10 deals in a day, I'd go bankrupt. So it's like, right. uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's funny because before you were talking about sales, right? So you were talking about how schools have a marketing program. Most of them end up doing sales. Like when I think when a lot of people think of like entry level sales, they're thinking B2B. They're thinking you know, maybe visit a client, but maybe start on the phone and selling services to another business. Is that when you, is that what you think of when you think of sales? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like I look at sales different. I look Mm -hmm. at sales like, like Facebook ads and, uh, marketing through content and reaching the audience and like getting big volumes of little sales of tiny, like transactions. It's still sales, but it's very different. Well, we are learning a little bit of that too, um, because of the podcast, you know, because we're trying to be this platform for business owners to get their message and get their community impact piece out. We have to learn how do we find, you know, that our audience can't just be made up of our merchants. It can't just be made up of the business people that we have connections to, or it won't be, you know, you, you can't, um, yeah, it's hard to selling, you gotta be the eight hundred pound gorilla in the room when you're talking about the internet. You know, you have to be able to yeah, take up very a lot hard. of space. Yeah, it's and very selling different. like selling a podcast, say like a view is a sale. Um, you know, ten is not what you want. You want more, but that the sales, I guess, if you want to call it that, of a podcast is probably more similar to it's B to C that rather than it is B to B because you want like a hundred thousand views and, and like you know, at least in the hundreds. Like, lots you know, of 10. low value touches, lots of smaller value touches rather than the, you know, the less touches for, for right. bigger clients, bigger sales. Like bigger if Elon Musk watches your podcast or if like some little five-year-old, it's still one view. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, so it's just a different thought process. I mean, it's something that we're interested in. And as far as brands go, do you attack, um, you know, do you, do you do that consultation with other brands that are looking to kind of pin down their niche or what does that um, Lowry Brands business do? So Lowry Brands is like the, is like the parent company. And basically we had, we had like three e-commerce sites, United Tees, this other one, United Monograms. And when we would like put out jobs and everything, uh, we'd be like, what's the name of like, we needed like one br- sure. like company, the like umbrella. corporate name. Yeah. So like right now under Lowry brands is the three e-commerce sites. I mean, United Monograms is definitely the main one, but technically the podcast is under Lowry brands. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's basically like our corporate name, like our back end uh, for employees. It's like the, the corporate name of a company. Like, did you know that KFC, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut are all owned by the same company? I did. Yeah, and it's called Yum Brands. Mm-hmm. So, so it's like kind of like that. What do you think of these people that are like when I go on Facebook because I do so much e-commerce business, I have so many e-commerce clients that are functioning mm-hmm. in that fashion, saving the money on those transactions online. I get a lot of Facebook ads for he. We are those people that can teach you how to grow your next million dollar business through mm-hmm. e-commerce online. What do you think about those guys? So I know all about those guys, and. Personally, I've never bought many classes or anything like that. Now, I have talked to smart people who swear by it. They swear that they enrolled in a course, whatever it was, if it was about um, how to podcast, how to sell, how to start a business, how to you know develop a, 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 a strong mindset. Like, There's all different kinds of, of courses out there. Um, and they sw- and they think it helped them. They think that 
you know, they, they sat down, they learned it, they invested in it, and that put them on the path to being more successful. I think most of them are bullshit. I think most of them are just crap, and it's a way for people to try to monetize what they're doing. I've been doing this podcast for 90 weeks, never made a penny. And I, I mean, I have my business that's doing well, that's kind of funding it, and it helps me be authentic and do it for fun and not have like a ulterior motive. Mm-hmm. Um, we were just discussing today that there's something – uh, there's something to be said for not everything in your business being so damn intentional. You know, every yeah. you have to have some place to be organic, even within your business that you can get out, you know, who you are and how you really operate. People appreciate that. If right. everything, if everything's smoking ladders, you know, all the time, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to build that trust with that audience you're talking about. You know, it's everything is, I can only give you this piece of content for, you mm-hmm. know, this advertising. I'm going to release this and, and, and hope I, that and you'll I, buy here. Yeah, and, and I feel these people. So, like, maybe the way you're monetizing your podcast is, like, connections, and then eventually those people use your services because you're talking to business owners, so there's the potential there. Um, a lot of people, like, if I didn't have my business and I was trying to monetize this podcast, how would I do it? Mm, I guess I would probably try to sell some type of service or something or some type of course. And I get it, but it's a bummer when like you have someone on your podcast or you start connecting with someone and then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, and here's my million dollar course or whatever. And you're like, oh, so that's, yeah. that was like what you were going for the whole time. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't have, I mean, I I, I get it, but I, yeah, it is weird and I, I don't, I don't love it. Yeah, me either. I mean, it it isn't. It, it it's just it's a strange way. It, it doesn't it doesn't accomplish what we want to accomplish. You right. know, we want to build a following. Is that you know we don't want to bring celebrities in here and then take advantage of our relationship with a celebrity. We want to bring celebrities and people that we want to be like here, so that we can learn from those people and spotlight those people and you know become those people. You know, become the, the celebrities. That's the way to the approach it. Impact. That's the way it's, to approach it. It's just so much. So, what does that look like for you? What is the community impact for you? What does giving back look like for you let's say um you know hypothetical sean lowry show has its first viral moment <laughs> um at the beginning of april of 2021 and um sean lowry's famous we see him on dr phil and oprah <laughs> and then may 1st what are we doing how are we how are we getting reconnected with that new audience that new community how are we giving honestly back? like i i'm like ready for that and uh you know I'm still very early. You're early. I'm still very early, but I wouldn't change. I would continue to just be authentic, not let it like go to my head. I would definitely, if Oprah calls, I'm going like I would, (laughs) I would, you know, I would take uh, those opportunities to, you know, get out there and talk to cool people. Like one of my dreams would be to go on like the Joe Rogan podcast. I think that would be so cool just because it's just fun and it's exciting. And it's a podcast that I've listened to Mm -hmm. like, it's been really rewarding for me to talk to some of these big names I've had in my podcast. Like, uh, like I said, Patrick, Pat, David, Evan Carmichael. Um, I don't, even, I don't know if you know this guy, Casey Adams. He's a young guy. He has a podcast, the rise of the young. Um, but I've been listening to these people for a while. And then when I podcast with them, get to know them a little bit, it's yeah, like, they become your peer. Okay. Yeah. They become your peer. And, and it's a really cool feeling. And I've, and I've had some of it and me and Patrick, Matt, David aren't best friends. Um, you know, but like, he'll he'll like my tweets once in a while or like repost a story of mine. And like, now if I ever do something big, he'll be like, I know that guy. So like, I'm kind of setting the tone for like a big future. Now it's, it's, it's time, man. And it's effort. And like, I feel like one of the things people respect over a period of time is like, damn, that guy's still going like, and then like, they, they like you for a little bit. And I do this. Like I like Gary V for example, I, I listen to him all the time. And then like a year or two will go by I forget about them. Then I like hear like hear them again and kind of get into. So I feel like with uh, people listening to content, they kind of go through like spurts. And if you're always there, uh, that like builds on itself like exponentially. So, um, so yeah, just being authentic, man. I mean, in those courses that you were talking about, to get back to that point, I don't know. I don't love them, and I do have this instinct where I see it and I'm like, I don't judge it, I don't hate it, but I have a negative like direction that I would 
lean towards when I see it, to be right. honest. I could see, um, you know, I could see that opening up for you though. You have one of those, those Facebook faces for someone. I would, <laughs> I would click the, at least the first two pages, you know, until I asked for my credit card info. If, if Sean Lowry was selling me how to make my next what, what, what would you want? All right. Like what you seem to be interested in it. Cause you asked about it. I am so let me ask you like, and I, and again, like, that's just my opinion. I'm not saying don't do it, but like what, okay. So become a millionaire, right? Say that's the headline. You click on it. There's so many, there's so many, like, what are you, there's so many different avenues that it could be. Is 100%. it, so what, what, what interests you? Like as a specific skill set or like a mindset thing? Uh, what interest? So I have a little bit of experience with, with this because like I said, I have some e-commerce clients and I have some that have come to me and I said, this company is going to do well and they've done well. I've had companies that have come to me and I, my, my thought process is this company is going to do really well and they haven't done well. And then I've had companies on the other side that I thought weren't going to do well that obviously, you know, it was a mixed bag as well. I had a company come to me last year at the beginning of COVID that says we work from home now. You know, we were offices, uh, we have full-time jobs and now we work from home. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, what is it that I can do for you? She's like, we want to start a new business. We want to deliver firewood to people in a very affluent area, Cobb County, Brookhaven area in Georgia. Um, okay. you know, a lot of money. So she was like, we're going to re, we're basically going to sell firewood on our website and we're going to deliver it. We're going to put people where we want. Um, and then came back to me a few months later and said, we're going to add mulch and pine straw as well. And then kind of let me in on the secret and told me, she was like, this, there is a person that lives in our neighborhood that has been doing this as their full-time business for like 12 years that has no presence online or marketing or anything like that. And he delivers- The delivery, the delivery of those things. Of those firewood mulch and pine Okay. Tree. So what they did was cut a deal with him where they're going to charge more than what he charges. They're going to upsell. They're going to get a buy rate from him and they're going to upsell. And so he's and doing, they're going to do the e-commerce. Yeah, and he's doing exactly what he's been doing. They are funneling him clients like never, never before, and they're making money, you know. And next thing I know, these people are doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in firewood, mulch, and pine straw. So the thought process, what what I'm interested in, is not really the mindset of things because I'm kind of in between that anyway. We we help so many small businesses from you know, a million dollars a month to a thousand dollars a month in volume. So I, I have to do a bunch of deals as well to get where I want. I, and it's mostly just because I have to continue to talk to the amount of people and build the amount of connections that I need to insulate my big picture as well. Okay. So what interests me is how the, the mindset of the buyer is how do you, how do you tap into the mindset of the consumer? I've never done roofing sales. I've never been a handyman. I've never sold to homeowners. You know, I've never sold insurance to people for the car. I've only ever done B2B. So when I see this Wix website that is very, very simple and some TikToks and some Facebook ads go up and I see, you know, several hundred thousand dollars in revenue from people that are selling mm-hmm. fine firewood. I raise my eyebrows and I say, mm-hmm. "What?" And I, I have a friend of mine. Another incredible example. He had an order. He had found this order for Legos. Um, not Legos like put together and build whatever you want, but like Lego mm-hmm. sets, Lego models. Like build mm-hmm. the Millennium Falcon. Build, you know, right. whatever. He got a truck full of like 3,000 of those puzzles in the box, in the plastic, brand new. And got them for free. Got them through a connection hubs that didn't didn't want them. They found them in a storage unit. Friend of his didn't want them. Dang. Kept them. Put them slow, slowly, put them online. Put them, put them on um, everywhere. Put them on Facebook. And slowly, they were selling 50, 60, 70 bucks a pop. Slowly. Never put a store together. Never put any technology into it. All the money they spent was for shipping. And What platform did they sell it on? Just Facebook. Just Facebook, Facebook. Marketplace. Facebook Marketplace? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And took the payments himself. Did everything. So I, I want... I, my interest is... There so you're are just in selling stuff on there. e-commerce? Yeah. There, there are those things that work really well. And there yeah. are rules... And there are things that you need to know before you hop in there. So that's my question is, you know. Dude, it, if I were you, you want to know what I would do? Um, on Etsy, you can, my cousin does this and he makes a good amount of money. You basically buy, no, no. You go to websites and you got to do a little research. But you you list 
other people's products. Say, I don't know, I'm just making something up. Abercrombie and Fish has this T-shirt. You go to Etsy, you list that shirt. If somebody buys it, it saves 25 bucks from there, you sell it for 30 then you just put in their address and ship it to them and collect the 30 bucks and pay the 25 and you made five bucks. Like it's like arbitrage, like retail yeah. arbitrage in that, in that sense, you don't have to do any physical shipping, but like Etsy is a really good place to do that. Yeah. Um, a, a friend of mine did that actually as well. You just reminded me that I met a few years ago. I haven't talked to this guy in a while. He did that with like baby products with like uh, Gerber, like bottles and toys and things like that. He was basically like that drop shipping method of reselling through yeah. different platforms online. So my thing though, man, my thing like personally is, I mean, I guess you have like your main business. Like there's a lot of people that are interested in this. I call it like retail arbitrage. People are trying to buy and sell things, making a profit on it and doing it in the simplest way possible using e-commerce or whatever. Like I respect that, but it's I, one thing I don't like about it is – I don't think it's really like it's not building a business. It's not building like a customer base. It's not building like a community of people who love your products because you're not sourcing anything that is uh sustainable necessarily. Right. Um now if you if you use say you get an Etsy store and you find people who love, I don't know, Star Wars shirts, and then you do that retail arbitrage thing, and then you build a Star Wars blog, and then you get a community of people, then you start selling them, I don't know, NFTs and, and gizmos, and, and then you start producing things. Like now you kind of have a community and a business and you can figure out how to source your products because like you built it around like Star Wars in this dumb example. But like... <laughs> If you're just selling like a thing here and a thing there, like you're not building a community around your products, you're not really building a business. You're kind of building a, a little bit of skills stream. to make some money yeah. here and there. And if that's what you're going for to make a few extra bucks, then that's cool. Um, but I'm interested in building like a business, a community, uh, something that's sustainable, long yeah. lasting, that can scale. Recognizable, and people who do retail arbitrage, brand. they're not building businesses. They're just building a little extra cash in their pockets. Right. And it depends what you're going for, but that's the way I look at it at that. Right. So what is it that what what is the um what what do you get with that? You know, building a business, you get the the flexibility to go in another direction, to add another arm, to add another branch is there. No, like say United Monograms, for example, right? That's my company. We had five million last year in sales. We're going for ten million this year. We're on pace. Um we are focused around our customers, the monogram community. We have people who have placed 40 orders with us. Like we have this Facebook group called the diamond club and it's a private Facebook group. And the girls in there are the gems. And, uh, my wife mo mostly runs it, but we have some loyal people who love our brand. Every Wednesday we go live on Instagram and we do this thing called live at lunch where like we show products. People love our brand and we, they know what they're going to get from us. They're going to get monogram clothing so like as trends change and as uh different things become popular we can create new products and, and, and bring a monogram into it it's it's a business that people come back to over and over that there's so much power in a brand and if you're just selling other people's brands and products you're not building your own brand and you're not building anything sustainable so like Building a company is something that can last for a long time. It's something that can last forever. It's something that has employees who show up to work every day and know what to expect. Yeah, there's the internal operations that you could use for other brands, but like building a brand is so much powerful. You don't buy Nike shoes because you like the logo or because they're the best price. You buy it because it's Nike. And that power is, is a company. And that's something that, last forever and that is something that people connect with that they want to pass down to their kids that it's, it's sustainable it's 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 real and like that's like what a company is and you know jim's drop shipping or whatever or just like an etsy store it's 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 if you stop doing it it'll die instantly it's 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 a it's a cash business for someone to make a few extra bucks but it's not a long lasting brand recognition sustainable company that is recognizable across the globe like that's the difference between the two things and i'm more interested in in the investing in the long-term brand 
sustainability the world domination aspect of things yeah yeah i like way, that yeah yeah i like that i mean i appreciate the information that you've given us man what would you tell people if you had to give any people some some advice um you know whether they're in that that frame of mind where they want to make a few extra bucks they want to build a brand what does it look like how do you how do people get started well there's two things there you said do you want to make a few extra bucks or do you want to build a company i mean entrepreneurship is the most rewarding thing in the world because human beings are built to biologically to want to progress every single day. They want to, they want to go towards something. They want to work on a team to build something better than themselves. And like entrepreneurships allows you to do that every single day to have challenges and overcome them and get the rewards that come from that. So like entrepreneurship is the perfect thing to make you happy. If you are into it now, it's very hard. You're going to fail. It's going to be, so difficult and it's so irrational to start a business i mean <laughs> why why it's does people need me does people need my service my product my information when you're just starting the answer is probably very rationally no so you have to be irrational to even start a business but that's where everyone starts at some point so you have to have like a confidence a leap of faith but if you are built out for it i think everyone at a point in their life should at least try something entrepreneurial and then you love it and you can't get enough of it, then keep going towards it because it is one of the most rewarding things in the world to start a business. So you talked about, what's the name of this podcast? Burn the ship. Burn the ship. That is an entrepreneurship term. So if you're going to burn the ship, what that means is give up uh, like your any safety nets and go after it. And I'm all for that. And I think people should do that if you're ready for it. So that's the first thing. The first thing you want to do if you're interested in entrepreneurship is develop the mindset. Understand how hard it's going to be. Understand it's not going to happen quickly. Read a few books about the challenges that the great entrepreneurs have overcome, the failures, the struggles, and then just like learn to know that you're going to have struggles and it's going to suck. So when the struggles come, you're not like, damn, I'm, I'm done with this. Yeah, you're training. like, oh, okay, this, this is cool because this is what happens to every entrepreneur. So the first thing to do is develop that mindset of how hard it's going to be. And then once you do that, then start your product or your service or your, or your content business or your whatever it is. And then you're in the game. Then that's the fun part. That's where the challenges begin. But now you're playing the game. Now you're on the field. And then you just have to learn about your specific industry. What do you want to do? Do you want to sell merchant services? Then become an expert in that and start fighting, start getting your first client, serve them, get your second client, build a team that's going to help the clients, but and then someone else is going to get new clients and the same person might have to do both at first. Or if you're in the content business, start and you just have to obsess over whatever it is that you sell. And everyone wants to start like the best thing in the world right off the bat. But I, when I started selling t-shirts at the very beginning, I didn't think really think I was going to take over the world. But like that led me to the Notre Dame thing, which led me to loving e-commerce, which led me to my, get my girlfriend involved, which led me to monograms, which led me to where I am now, which is building this factory. And who knows that where, where that will lead me. So it's like take it step by step. And it's great to have like a, a beautiful end game vision. But sometimes you, it doesn't play out that way. You have to adapt and adjust and pivot. And those skills in entrepreneurship are something that are hard because if you think it's going to happen one way and it doesn't, you can't get flustered by that. You have to go with the flow a little bit, but you have to have the talent and skills and experience to kind of know when to adjust, when to stick, stay the course. But it's so fun because it's a journey every single day and you're like the, the main character in your own story and you're all on this journey. So develop the mindset, pick your industry. And if you have a few different things you want to do, just pick one and start. And then... Focus on it, focus on it, focus on it, obsess over it, and over time, slowly make adjustments. And the best feeling in the world for me, man, was not having to have a job and having to be able to have enough money to get my first, uh, like, little warehouse space, a little a little office. Um, and I basically, like, lived there. And I was like, I'm an entrepreneur now. I'm making enough money where I can do it on my own. And then it's all gone from there. So, like, just know it's going to be a long journey. Pick your market. And go step by step and enjoy the ride. And uh, 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what are you looking for? If uh, if any of our listeners, uh, myself, what are you looking for? Who are you looking to connect with, both from you know business aspect, the show aspect? Um, what should we what should we be looking for as connections for Sean Lowry? I mean, I love entrepreneurship. I love talking with people who are starting businesses from the very beginning. I love hearing about different people's mindsets. Um, let me ask you about you real quick, right? Sure. So you got your you got your merchant services business, mm-hmm. and that's going pretty well, right? Sure. Oh, and yeah. then and then you're also doing the podcast, mm-hmm. and uh, you're starting off with that. You're you're kicking it. Um, and then you're also interested in like selling stuff, e-commerce, right? Sure. Um, like, what's it say behind you on the wall? Ackworth. It's the city we're in. Yeah. Oh, it's the city you're in. Okay, yep. I thought it might be the name of your company or something. Like, do you have a grand vision? Like, is your is your merchant services your grand vision and these other things that kind of help serve it? Or like, are you trying to pick and choose a few things? Because there are some entrepreneurs who just want to like do a few things and make a few bucks. Is that kind of like the alley you think you're in? Or no, like, no. Where do you um, see yourself? That's yeah, that's not really even close. So my background, I was in high school. I was an athlete. I played basketball, and that's what I really went okay. to college to do. So I needed the grind. Um, that's what I appreciate. Is I was not good grind. at basketball when I started, and then you know, five, six, seven years, it's just a completely different ball game. I'm destroying people that used to teach me, you know. So I started this, at, you know, from a weird place in my life. You know, I had, um, I have a kid. I have a four year old kid. So, oh, you do? Mm-hmm, yeah, and I'm 24, cool. so I was very young. Came home, um, had injuries to my knees, so came home, started a. Um, job with a, like a profile extrusions company, like a metal extrusions company, kind of running logistics for them there. I um, was pretty good at it. Math and, and scheduling time management is something I was really good at. And then I kind of took the same role at a landscaping company of, you know, we had 30 crews and I had to make sure 30 crews of, you know, 100 people get where they're supposed to do and do their work every day. Cool. So I, I was making a lot of money, you know, I made plenty of money. They're very successful companies, but there was no grind, you know, it mm. was just the grind was how long can you do the same thing? You know, that, that is the grind. And that was, I didn't feel myself progressing. It wasn't very rewarding. Right. Um, like I was just talking about it. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't want that. So I started doing this and I sucked at this and my, my, the owner What's of this? my company. What do you mean by this? Merchant your, services. Your merchant services? Okay. Yeah, merchant services. I've been doing it for like four years and some change. So okay. the owner of my company is Jay Worthy. You should definitely have him um, on with you, whatever that looks like, okay. and have a communication with him because, you know, he's been 20 years in this merchant services game. He's from a uh, background, actually, R.J. Reynolds um, going to NASCAR races and selling cigarettes was his original first sales wow. gig and then got into Sidcore <laughs> and office supplies and just took it from there and has been in the merchant services game for a long time. And everything from the beginning was was taking what he knew and pushing it in a direction. What I So I was knocking on doors. You know, I was 19 years old. I was limping around because my knee was destroyed. Um, and I was knocking on people's doors and asking them. Yeah, I was asking them, hey, can I help you with your merchant services? And I did a bunch of deals. I did a bunch in my hometown. I did well. And then it slowed down and it slowed down. And uh, initially, I just ran out of low-hanging fruit, man. I, I ran out of those first-degree connections. I ran out of hometown business. I ran yeah. out and I was like, where do we go when... You know, you're in the middle of nowhere and you know no one. How do you conjure up money out of thin air? And then I, that was, you know, you know, a year in when I'm running out of, you know, the easy connections, the easy deals. I'm like having that conversation with myself of like, okay, you're basically, you know, all you've been doing is floating on, you know, connections you've been having for your whole life. Now <laughs> is the real grind is you've got to figure out truly how to acquire clients with, nothing with no connection no pretense and you don't have to be able to walk in their door and whip paper out and close them right there but you have to have this process you have to build this process for yourself of new people people you've met once people you've met twice people you've met 10 times and you have to balance all of these people all the way through the process until you figure out what your sales process works it didn't it took me until you know, I was networking one place and I'd do a few deals here and then I'd jump to another networking group and then I'd go meet a bunch of tech people and I'd do a few deals. The beginning of COVID sat us down so quick, man. I mean, it mm. was sit down. You aren't doing the things that you were doing anymore. You know, mm-hmm. have a team meeting and say, what is phase seven and 10 and 11 and 25 of COVID because everyone else has taken a couple of weeks off. Everybody that I knew you, in the you merchant sell like, service Do you sell like game. physical credit card processors like to retail stores? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. So that so retail got killed. So that affected your business a lot. Yeah, right? for sure. I built my business mostly on service people at first because I knew the mm-hmm. language. I knew landscaping. I knew manufacturing. I knew the people that come to your house and fix stuff. I knew how to do it. I knew what it cost. I knew uh, what you were paying most of the time because you're using Square or QuickBooks or something. So I knew all that. I had a diverse book of service people, retail, restaurants, all all kinds of stuff. But then mm. COVID hit, and it and it's. Dang. You can't go to your network and, be, and meet people anymore. It's right. now you've got to create your own virtual networking group, and now you have Absolutely. to figure out how to mark, market business people to get them there. And that was phase one for us. Was we started a virtual networking group that is a year strong. Dude. We're actually about to do our our one year anniversary party, and <laughs> it got up to like a hundred business owners every week, and it's still about fifty every other week. Um, Dang, and it's good. That's awesome, it, man. Yeah, it's been good. So then we started. Dude, the podcast yeah. we started here's how we're going to get people build relationships and show them who we are and let them know what they're supporting when they do business with us and yeah. then uh the next phase of that is the podcast has to be not only do we deliver it from the business owners it has to be something that has value to you know people that are interested in these subjects is how do you make sure that you're you're delivering good information that people are interested in being entrepreneurs how do you right. make sure that you're connecting with an audience of people that aren't already people that are looking to be in that b2b market you know how right. do you make and develop and create a brand that has value to other people that is something i'm interested in in yeah. all in all aspects Dude. of what that looks like monetarily i'm interested in the people that make a statement you know every time you're looking for these fortune whatever companies that are going to reply to what's going on around them because it matters, you know, and they're people that you align and identify yourself with and you don't even know what people those are. That's what I want to be. You know, I want to be a, a foundation and, a, and have the ability to impact my community in a way and give back resources and time and energy and effort and money the way that those people did for me um, and kind of got me to where I am today. That That's my vision. My vision is, is only a small portion of my vision in the beginning is monetary. It's impact based. You know, it's eyes based. Dude. It's, Dude, it's you're, you're 24 years based. old. You're smart as hell. You understand the grind. You're very experienced. You've been through different uh, like obstacles now, like COVID. You're smart enough to put all the shit together. And dude, I think you're going to be a huge success. So to answer your original question, what type of people am I trying to connect with? I'm trying to connect with smart ass young entrepreneurs like you. I got you. That's the answer to that question. I got you. There's a bunch. <laughs> um, look through uh, look through Burn the Ship. We got a bunch of them. Any of those people that you like, we'll be more than happy to make a strong introduction with. We love those people. Those people support us like crazy. So um, yeah. yeah, I got you. I'll keep you in mind. I want to continue talking. I want to continue learning from you. I'm, I'm glad to be in your network. Uh, I'm glad to know as you're a friend, I'm very excited to see what you and your brand um, does in the future. Tell me this, if people are looking to get um, a hold of you, if there are people out there, how do they find you? Where do they find you at? How do they get in touch with you? Instagram, Sean Lowry 20, Twitter, Sean Lowry 20. If I could make a request, I'd say follow me on YouTube. I'm trying to build up the YouTube channel and I love, I love video content. I think I, uh, I think if you just hear my voice, but if you see my face too, I like I look I got these smiley eyes I've been told. So like I, I like the video component. So I like I like uh, YouTube. Sure. Um but just Sean Lowry, Google me, find me. And uh it's not that it's not that hard to to get a hold of me. Cool. Well anybody myself I look forward, like I said, I look forward to having you back on, seeing how things develop. Yeah, man. Um, we're now connected and uh like sure. we're both young and we got a bright future ahead. Yeah. And like that's the beauty of this. You make me aspire to bring some swag to my podcast room too <laughs> look at that you got a nice you got a nice shelf over Spice there up a little bit yeah i mean yeah. we're and we're and we're putting together a new uh in-person studio oh yeah at the new building so yeah we'll so maybe, have to come up there and check it out as well yeah maybe down the road yeah, yeah you know Do some uh, on the spot set stuff. up we want it to be like uh create an experience for like guests to come in i want to put like a little basketball hoop in there make an experience out of uh being a guest on the podcast so sure. that's going to be at the new building so i'm excited about that so yeah that would not be too far away georgia and south carolina that's oh, yeah, not we're far. really close yeah we're really close yeah i'm in charleston you're right yeah well for sure um let's stay in contact anything we can do for you we'll put the links to everything on the video as soon as this gets edited we'll get it out to you and your channels and all of our people um, and yeah. i appreciate you man i appreciate you coming all right, man, on. it's I appreciate been a pleasure yeah yes, Later, sir. Bailey. see ya